Wa Wa Sengbo Nini Nilang Konnichiwa Welcome to Think and Yeah, Think Like a Strategist. Uh, today we have an amazing guest and we have an amazing topic. So the question for today is, how does one think like a strategist when it comes to behavioral science slash behavioral economics? Uh, today we've got an amazing guest, uh, Luella. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Cool. So can you just tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into the topic of behavioral science or behavioral economics? Uh, cool, no problem. So my name is Luella Nodada. Um, from the Eastern Cape, um, moved to Gauteng for study purposes. So um, I'll focus more on that because that's what we're going to talk about. I uh, started my educational career within uh, University of Pretoria, did in economics and then did statistics. And you'll start to see as we talk about behavioral economics how the two kind of intersect. Um, uh, coming out of that, I then started working in consulting, um, doing behavioral economics. So a more application-based type of behavioral economics um, and list um, research. So became very application, solving problems for businesses from the beginning using the science. Very new to it, um, but quick to learn it. And it's quite exciting actually to figure out that there is a science behind how we think and how we make decisions. Amazing. So before we get into it, um, you know, in, in, in advertising, there's always something new. And I think I got introduced to it about two or three years ago, uh, you know. Um, and when I first heard about it and when I started to hear what this thing is, I got excited. It felt like, you know, there was a chance for advertising. Because for the longest time, it's always, it ebbs and, ebbs and flows, right? Where you're like, is advertising important? You know, yes it is. And then it's like, no it isn't. It's like, do we have a role to play? No, we don't. No, we, yes we do. You know, like the instances where there was a period where we were talking about consultancies. Consultancies coming into, you know, into the advertising and marketing space, taking our share because advertising has no value. Consultancies were perceived to, to bring something of value. So when I landed on behavioral science or behavioral economics, I was like, my goodness, here is our hope. So before we get into how it connects to advertising, how would you define behavioral economics? What is it? Um, so that's an interesting one, one I get asked all the time. And the definition is standard, but I always explain it differently. Today, what I want to say is it's almost like an intersection of um, sciences that speak about social sciences, right? So the behavior of human beings. So we look at economics, we look at psychology, we look at so sociology. How do those then feed into how the average person will make a decision? So it's the science of the irrationality um, models more than anything. So for instance, traditional economics is based on theories of rationality that assume that uh, Luella, for instance, will be able to assess like a budget line, be able to figure out this is what I like, this is my preference, and given what I have with my constraints, this is how I maximize my utility. Um, behavioral economics tells you that um, human beings ultimately when making decisions are not always rational um, and in most cases will produce uh, well, sorry, will behave in a predictable manner irrationally. Mm -hmm. So you will constantly um, find that in general, people, when given a certain context, will behave in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so we take a lot of cues, for instance, uh, when making decisions from um, what's the other person doing. So we call that quite a lot of times social proof or herd behavior. So what are other people who I think represent me within this um, array of people, um, you know, like billions of people, but what is the mass doing that represents me? And we find that we use that as a premise to make a decision. It doesn't actually speak to how you'd maximize what you want out of a situation. Mm. But you think that because, um, you know, other people are doing it, maybe this is the right thing to do. So a lot of the time, the brain, the human brain requires shortcuts. Uh, if you can think about the number of decisions that we make um, during the day, from the time you wake up, um, so some of them are kind of, you know, uh, in the background. So putting on your slippers when you come out of bed, it's actually a decision. Mm -hmm. So some of them have to be less active because your brain is constantly on. So wherever the brain can take a shortcut, it will take a shortcut. Mm -hmm. And this is consistent across every type of human being um, in the world. This is something that we're going to do when faced with too much information, you're probably going to disengage. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that. Um, 
and maybe uh, for a more extensive explanation, the human brain, uh, we kind of split it in these two theories of thinking, right? So we have like your system one of thinking and your system two of thinking. So we have an automatic system. So automatic system is that's the quick one. We want to make snap decisions. This is where, um, you know, like easy decisions should be sitting there. However, we do find that a lot of the time we are making complex decision making using our system one, mm. which means you are bound to make errors. Mm. Your system two is what we'd call, you know, your more, I want to say, what's the right word? Um, conscious decision making, right? Mm. So system two is you solving a math problem, mm. right? So it's you sitting mm. in the front of a taxi and you have like 50 rand, 100 rand coming from back and forth. <laughs> That's your system two. You are doing mm. all this math to figure out how do you split this change um, behind you. And you can't do that in your system one. You can't is it? do an automatic thing unless it's all like 10 bucks. But yeah. Yeah, I digress. If it's like 13 rands. If it's 13 rand 50 and the other person's giving you 20 rand, the one's giving you 50, you have to do that in your system too, mm. which is fine, right? So in theory, we should be making a lot of these decisions that actually speak to um, maximizing our personal utility mm. in our system too, right? Mm. Um, so you choosing a product, for instance, this is actually specific to you. This is for your home, your family, and how this is going to work out. It's just based on what you prefer. Mm. But we find that when, even when selecting complex, um, well, faced with complex choices, our brain still wants to go to system one, right? Especially mm. once it becomes too complex, We're like, oh goodness, let's speak to a financial advisor. Tell me what to buy. Mm. Um, so. What I do then, mm. a lot of the time, is to try to make sure that when you are making decisions, you are using the right system of thinking. Okay. So, of course, I don't need you to always um, be in your system one because that's exhausting. Mm. But there are times where it's very important, especially um, working in financial services, to mm. make sure that clients are in the system one, sorry, mm. system two of thinking when making decisions. Because mm. this is a product, right? Um, you're taking out a product. We need you to make sure it's the right one for you. Mm. So then I come in and make sure that in the way that we are communicating um, and the way that we are interacting with our clients, they are able to make sound decisions that maximize both their utility and clients' mm. personal utility. Yeah. Okay. I've got a question for that, but I just want to make a point. Uh, when the, the, the system that you, you choose to use or that you employ at a certain time, does it depend on the novelty of the activity, what I mean is, uh, when you start driving, uh, because you're not used to all these functionalities, changing your gear. I remember when I started driving, I needed to think that, oh, I need to change my gear. Oh, I need to look up the rear view mirror. Oh, I need to indicate. Uh, and then, as soon as I got the hang of it, I was eating, you know, I could eat anything whilst driving. And people who are not used to driving, they're like, hey, you know, you're gonna crash, you're gonna, but my mind is already, uh, you know, set in this thing. I'm, I'm already used to, uh, you know, doing a lot of things. So does that mean I start from system two and then gradually with certain things shift into system one? Yes. Um, so 100%. But some of these things are also, uh, so for instance, driving and some automatic things that we do with our bodies, some of them are neuro decisions, right? Mm. So it's not... Uh, a psychological decision, okay. if I'm making sense. So that pathway is created elsewhere. Mm. But yes, when you start to learn how to drive, because it's a complex thing to do, mm. you'll start in your system. Am I getting my systems wrong? System two. Yes. System two, yes. So you start in your system two because you're consciously trying to um, mm. understand what you're doing, make sure you're doing the correct thing. Is the clutch in, am I changing the brake at the right, well, pressing the brake at the right time, gear, this and this. Mm. But once it becomes natural, it does become mm. more of a system one. It's automatic, mm. right? The same way that you can get into your car, um, and not actually remember how many robots were either on or off. You, you just drove, you know, because yeah. it's something that you're used to doing. Uh -huh. However, if you find like, for instance, it starts raining, your brain now is going to shift back to a more conscious thing because now you're Correct. driving consciously. Mm. This is why you find a lot of the time we're also turning down the volume when we lost to concentrate, we overstimulate. <laughs> um, so it's, a, it's an interesting yeah, thing like that we that. all do these, it's quite predictable among all of us. And <laughs> like, it's not an IQ thing. And a lot of the yeah. time people think that um, once you're a smart person, um, behavioral sciences and behavioral economics doesn't really apply to you. Mm. And once you can identify it, and that's not how it works. It's not about smarts. It's not about, um, you know, um, how much money you have, mm. how educated you are. We, mm or are all susceptible to this because it's a decision-making thing. And mm. decision-making is consistent um, in terms of how it works across yeah. human beings.
Amazing. So you work for a bank, right? Yes. So I'm trying to figure out at what point does behavioral science plug in or behavioral economics plug in in the value chain? So obviously the end goal is to sell a product or a service, right? Uh, where in that value chain from your end do you plug in or come in? Are you there from beginning to end or do you come in there in between? Um, you can answer that. And then secondly is from a creative agency perspective, where do you think behavioral economics should become uh, a thing in the process? Okay, so where does it plug in in terms of the process of creating goods and services, for Correct. instance, right? And then where does it come together with advertising? Correct. Okay. So in terms of well, my, actually, yeah, I'll be taking too much credit to say it's just my thought. Um, I think as a community, mm. we do believe as practitioners that behavioral sciences, whenever you are designing something that has to do with people, mm. that's where behavioral science should start. Um, but because the field is growing and it's it, like it's very nice to see it's growing in different like parts of the world It's booming actually um, It is getting to a point where we're starting to see the value of even at product inception mm. Right where we're trying to figure out um, for instance, this is an insurance product this is the type of person we're looking for You need to bring in the behavioral scientists at mm. the beginning to make sure that we are actually creating a product in a way that speaks to the person, not just rationally, but also to the irrationality mm. as well mm. so in most practices, we find that um, we'll come in towards once there's a problem, right? Everything's been created. We're like, why aren't people paying e-tolls, for instance? Then they're like, let's bring in the behavioral um, scientists, they bring in behavioral economics, um, economists, sorry. Um, in theory, we, they should have started at inception mm. when creating the whole, it's a new mm. tax, right? And it's got to do with people. Not only what are the people's budget lines saying, so it's one thing for it to be affordable. There is um, willingness to pay, mm. right? So willingness to pay is now speaks to decisions. And as you can see with something like Etoll's um, very interesting social decision was made by the mass population. Mm. And once you have a herd of people that are not complying to something, very difficult to get others to mm. then comply. So it's very difficult to now shift. So ultimately, we do tend to come in towards the end to solve a particular problem. And not ideal. Uh, not ideal, but you know, um, I suppose as you are growing a science or any type of mm. practice, you need to be able to show value at all the points of you know um, the value chain. So mm. if we're coming in at the end, we can still do that, but we would definitely have, I think, bigger imp impact if we were able to be part of the beginning processes mm. so this is not something that's not happening like okay. they are you know a lot of different places different banks that are actually working on things like this mm. um and it's also happening across yeah it, industries um if you think about um covid pandemic right so this will speak more to behavioral sciences as opposed to behavioral economics um you need to get people to comply and this actually impacts the survival of you know your population for instance mm. Um, so those simple stickers on the floor, there's no penalty for not standing on that sticker. Mm. There's no one telling you to stand on that sticker. There's simply a sticker <laughs> and you tend to stand there. No one's told you to do this, but you will stand there. So things like that mm. become a solution where we know we need, behavior needs to be changed to solve for a certain problem mm. um, and we can implement different things and it becomes part of sometimes an end situation so how do we drive vaccinations is another thing mm. that would we'll use behavioral sciences mm. to do because ultimately it's not just about information and this is what a lot of the time people think it's about it's not just about information or about understanding what a vaccine is right mm. so that's important definitely mm. but it's a decision that you need to make mm -hmm. so then how do we try and make sure that when you are making your decision you are weighing out this information that you're getting rationally so that's what we'll do at the end part okay. of things so then when it comes to advertising i think there's like a very interesting intersection because we work quite closely um yeah advertising um found it very interesting it's, it's, it's a very interesting field for me in that it established itself so long ago that there's no requirement to prove um impact mm. right mm. which is as the behavioral economics economists sorry um we have to constantly prove value right so when you use advertising where you have like this reach for mass um, communication we would then come and look at how are we showing up 
right? So, and it's interesting because advertising, there's a lot of copy that's also like created on that side. So when I say copy, I mean content, right? Mm. Um, but then we then come in and be like, okay, no, no, let's swap the wording around here, right? Okay. It's, it's not that simple, but like let's swap the wording around based on this and this and this. This is how this would land. Um, so the two intersect quite closely. Um, in fact, the two are like an over an overlap mm. of some, there's an overlap there of, of sorts um, because what we are trying to do ultimately is create um, some salience around a certain products mm. right and we want our customers to then or clients or our target audience to then make a decision and this is pretty much the same but um, within our context we then would look at what's the science behind um, if we're using these colors for instance if you're using this type of wording how does the average person then react to this are we going to be mm -hmm. able to measure this impact and so forth so we there's a very close intersection uh, work very closely with advertising um, in fact any form of mass communication um, is required mm -hmm. for a behavioral intervention mm -hmm. okay so i've been using the words interchangeably. i don't know if i should be using interchangeably uh, what's the difference between behavioral science versus behavioral economics? Is there a difference? Is there a nuance? So the nuance, um, so I want to say behavioral economics is a subset of behavioral science. Right? Okay. So behavioral science will speak to how humans behave, how you make decisions, um, and we don't always need to measure economic uh, value right or utility so behavioral mm -hmm. economics specifically speaks to how you then make decisions that relate to economic and utility um, mm -hmm. related things so okay. how do you purchase things for yourself how do you select goods and services mm -hmm. um, for yourself um, and economically does it make sense utility wise mm -hmm. does it make sense budget constraints mm -hmm. does it make sense mm -hmm. whereas the science again would speak to how do we drive a mass change in you know um, littering right mm -hmm. you bring in behavioral scientists for that, right? We need to, it's, um, you, so the big thing is it can't be financial incentives, right? So what type of behavioral incentives can we put into place okay. to then drive a certain behavior change? And mm. it's not always about maximizing a utility, like a personal utility, it could mm. be a social utility. Okay. Right? So that speaks to more of a population. Mm. So that's more behavioral science. Mm. And then behavioral economics is how do we then create um, a decision path for you to maximize your personal utility. How do you assign goods and services using your decision making in a way that maximizes your utility? Mm. So why is it that, I suppose maybe it's because it's fairly new. Uh, in your world, are you starting to get to a place where you are active from the beginning and not just plugged in later on when initially we're trying to solve this problem but then later on organization or somebody realizes actually uh, maybe we might need Eluela? Uh, not enough, I think. So yes, there are definitely opportunities where we are part of inception of certain, I'm going to call it a decision journey, right? Okay. Um, so that's from we're just looking at the human decision making around certain products. So from the time we create it, we make sure that like this is going to align with what the average consumer would do. Um, but not enough, I think. Mm. I think there's, yeah, definitely much more um, that would be great in that space. But it is something that is growing. Mm. Um, yeah, your behavioral banks uh, will use a lot of data, you know, analysis and look mm. at um, patterns and forecasting a type of behavior. But they also then will come back and look at the theories and, you know, the research behind behavioral sciences. How do we then counter for this thing? How do we make sure that this person stays on this decision map that we had created mm. for them at inception of this product, for mm. instance? So it's definitely growing. Uh, it's very exciting times, actually, because it's growing in places I actually did not imagine, like um, vehicle industry as well, mm. you know, bringing mm. in... Well, when I say could not imagine, maybe because um, I haven't researched enough, but in the place where I never thought I'd be interested to work as a behavioral scientist or a behavioral economist, economist <laughs> Um, but it's growing. It's part of mm. yeah, motor industry. We're looking at like, different things. So some industries, for instance, where um, things that you just find interesting and then the more you learn about the science, you actually realize there's tons of people working behind this. Um, so mm. in the mining industry or any places where they factories, mm. they bring in behavioral scientists there because we need people to comply. Um, to the health and safety regulations mm. within that certain context, right? Mm. So, and the implications of people not are quite massive, right? So people die on sites, you know, because mm. you're not wearing the right glove or you know mm. what it is. So mm. 
bring in quite a lot of behavioral scientists to work on things like that. Um, so the more you research, the more you learn. So I, like I always found those things fascinating, but I didn't know that there's a whole science behind how you make people comply to mm. safety and health regulations. Mm. The theory is that if you are a rational thinking person and they tell you that if you touch this, you'll cut off your hand. You're the theory is that you're not, you're not going to do it, right? Mm. But in practice, theory, yeah. in practice, you probably irrationally, like people just do things irrationally. Yeah. And it's not um, a shortfall, I want to say, in the person. It's just a shortfall in how the brain works and attempt mm. to make these um, efficient decisions. Uh, sometimes we then take shortcuts, then mm. cause inefficiencies. Mm. Um, a great example, actually, I think um, it had to do with, uh, so once people wear protective gear, for instance, like in um, a factory, you have this um, irrational belief that you're fully protected. So you start to oh. become a little more dangerous. I think it's called moral hazard. Moral hazard. Yes. I think it's, it's called moral hazard. Um, but you start to feel the same way. Once you get insurance, you drive a little bit more carelessly. <laughs> like I'm covered. <laughs> um, so people actually also do this in a context where it's going to hurt themselves physically, mm. right? I suppose even in a car. But like in a factory, once they have safety gear on, you start to feel like I'm invincible. So people are actually getting more hurts because, um, mm. you know, there's more accidents because people are actually less careful. Mm. So um, I think this was in Australia. Maybe I shouldn't actually quote where things are if I'm not sure. But um, mm. they had skeletons, like pictures of skeletons on the actual gloves. And now yeah. the brain actually, you can kind of see your bone structure on this glove. Oh, wow. Made people a little bit, little bit more careful. Wow. So those are like interesting things that, um, as like a social, like be, sorry, behavioral science intervention. That's like we can't immediately measure um, a personal utility in terms of economic value. Um, mm -hmm. There is one in terms of you know your person, you know, being safe. But like that's an interesting one where we just create little brain paths for you mm -hmm. to make a decision that keeps you at, uh, maximizing your utility in that context, so not getting hurt. Wow. Um, is the are we able to quantify? behavioral science slash maybe economics contribution to business decision making. Uh, you know, to say, okay, you know, we were about to do this thing, but then, um, you know, how much money we've saved, or are you able to quantify the, the role of behavioral science or behavioral economics? Um, yes. So a big part of behavioral economics is actually uh, making sure that we are measuring. Um, so that also depends on what, for instance, what your objective is and what the product is and so forth. But um, on a general level, we work on what we call like a four phase, four, five phase approach. And this is quite standard across um, behavioral science, sometimes in behavioral economics across yeah, the world actually. So we have this four, five model where we kind of identify a problem, translate it to a behavioral economics problem. So um, people aren't buying cars. How do we increase buy-in or whatever it is? So just like translating that problem to a behavioral problem, not just okay. we're not making sales. Yeah, yeah. Then we need to talk about what other decisions that people are making that are deterring mm. this. So we go into then understanding that entire process of decision making, understanding what the actual process is of making a purchase, for instance, of any type of product, looking at what are the different communication channels that start from um, like your SMSs, for instance, or like if it's, is it a contact center environment? Mm -hmm. Is it just like uh, mass marketing? Like what are we, what, how are we communicating this product? So looking at that entire process, the people involved in the process, um, including client or our, uh, yeah, yeah, our target audience, and then figuring out where we need to either make it easier for people to make decisions or more difficult. So when I say more difficult, mm -hmm. um, your retirement space, we don't want you purchasing the wrong product. So this needs to be a, a situation where you mm. think hard. So it's, it's quite important. It's got long-term implications or your investment products. Um, but if you're buying like McDonald's, I uh, probably should not say that, but <laughs> if you're buying a burger, um, <laughs> you can change this decision at any mm. point. Like mm. if you don't like it tomorrow, you don't buy it. So it's not mm. a long-term situation. So once we've gone there, we then come up with theories on what is the actual problem. Information overload, uh, you're going to disengage. Um, or maybe it's just physically too difficult to do this thing. 
Mm. Um, I was on an online platform and suddenly I need to go to um, like a face to face situation. Like I need to stop what I'm doing and get into and then go do a face to face making it too difficult to kind of actually follow through on a decision that you already made. So once we've kind of come up with a premise, mm. we then figure out, okay, so we don't want you to disengage with this information overload. Maybe let's frame things differently, right? So maybe move things around, um, change the wording, uh, maybe move the technical wording, for instance, where it's not really important to have it here to a different part of it. Then we then will set up on a path where we set, take, look for a test group and a control group. Right. So that's the big part of behavioral economics. We mm. are testing, consistently testing. I like that. Um, things against an existing sometimes. Sometimes it's not an existing. We look at a historical pattern. But mm -hmm. if we have an existing group that's already receiving a certain type of communication mm. and we then come up with a hypothesis to kind of alleviate what we identified so that information overload, we then would have a, con a, a test group and we use the existing one as a control group. Right? Mm. We measure outcome from that. Okay. Um, so, of course, the groups need to be groups that, in theory, are similar. Mm. So, we're not mm. selecting someone that we know or a group that we know is going to perform better. We select mm. a, a group that should ultimately, behaviorally, perform mm. in similar ways unless the intervention has okay. come into play. So, that allows us to then say, uh, because we followed this pattern until, you know, March of 2022, mm. and starting um, April of 2022, we implemented this for this group and we let this group continue in this manner. Once we've run this test and we look at the outcomes, for instance, if we're measuring sales, if we're measuring uh, retention, um, we are then able to say that what led to this uplift with group, um, test group, is behavioral economics, because the only mm -hmm. thing that's changed here mm. is how we communicated what we're communicating, mm. and these groups are the same. And then you can measure, for instance, your uh, revenue, if you're looking at revenue, or you can mm. measure what it means to retain the clients, what's still in their bank account, mm. and so forth. Have we saved? Have we lost? So, yes, the big part of it is being able to measure, 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 okay. measure. Then how do, we, how do we do that? Maybe this might be an unfair question. In an uncontrolled environment, like mass, where, say, for example, um, you know, we do a campaign, but then... Um, you know, there's so many different touch points. Uh, you know, there's a TVC, there's a radio campaign, um, you know, and I know there are some tactics that one can use, for example, using a specific code for, you mm. know, SMS this, whatever, uh, you know. So what I'm trying to say is, I'm an agency, right? I'm a creative agency. I want to build a case for the fact that our campaign was successful. Um, you know, it was successful because of what we implemented. Those sales, our campaign contributed to, to them. Mm. How do I do that? So, yeah, it's, it's definitely a difficult question. Um, it is one that we're constantly trying to solve for as well, right? So what measurement metrics do you put in place mm. for, um, you know, in order to be able to actually attribute, attribute an intervention or success of a certain thing to a certain intervention? So like a lot of the time, it's, it's done backwards again, right? Mm. So, um, so for instance, advertising has got, I want to say like an intrinsic value, right? Mm. So it's valued in a way that actually can't be measured, mm. right? But mm. it's valuable. Mm. We know that in the absence of it, correct, we lose money. Correct. But we can't actually pinpoint mm. that with this advertising, we're making money. Mm. But if we take it away, we're definitely losing money. So <laughs> it's almost the other way around. But uh, within those contexts, right, like you're saying, you have to create different touch points, uh, not a one problem solution, one solution problem. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So um, you need to try different things out, right? So you're talking about, you could, some people do the QR codes and mm. all of that. Mm. So trying to figure out how many people actually uh, use this thing when looking at this billboard, you know, did it work? Mm. And it does, it's an interesting way of engagement, right? It also just kind of tells you how much your people are engaging with mm. your certain types of billboards as mm. well, like where it is. Mm. So you're not just measuring impact for um, a certain product, you're also mm. measure, measuring location, right, in terms of mm. if it's a billboard. But in context like that, um, yeah, I do think, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a difficult one. Um, mm. You kind of need to figure out the way you think you'd be more impactful mm. in terms of measurement. So do I want to do this in terms of a competition? Like when I say competition, enter this, right? Mm. So that, that still tells you mm. um, some engagement in terms of like marketing. 
uh, but I don't know. Let me try to solve for this in my head. Mm. I think sometimes, I suppose it depends on what the campaign is trying to do. Yes. Uh, sometimes it's long term, uh, right? Like if you're trying to change perceptions around... It takes a long time, yes. Yeah, around, around the brand. Uh, I suppose, you know, guys like Kanta and, you know, all these research houses are able then to say, from a brand health perspective, this is how people were thinking about yes. your brand or understood your brand. And then after this campaign, we, we, we do another you know, dipstick research, yeah. and then it's like, okay, there's a shift now, post this campaign. Yeah, and often those are like long-term things, so you need yeah. to measure like once every five years, sometimes sometimes 10 years. Um, mm. And not just in advertising, like I'm thinking now about, um, when we talk about behavioral sciences, so campaigns like the Soul Buddies campaign, mm. that's a big thing where we need to start getting people to be quite health aligned, right? And we're looking mm. at, um, you know, uh, kids need to understand their own safety. So there was a lot of things going on within the Soul Buddy mm. campaign and doing a Buddy Buddy accountability thing mm. that then, if you, for instance, introduce this show in 1994, and you introduce mm. this Buddy system in 1994, 1995, when do you measure to say that the type of adult that came out of that, mm. um, who was part of this intervention, they were mm. part of the Soul Buddies um, campaign, mm. did then they become... Uh, more health conscious people for instance or more socially responsible people mm. when do you measure and so those things are actually quite interesting for me especially when it comes to advertising because again it's an awareness thing mm. um, and it's a salience thing and you, there's this mass uh, production and less mass um, you know I want to say launch of a certain um, kind of campaign but sometimes it is a long-term one so especially mm. when it comes to brand loyalty uh, which is a big thing that we also try to work on quite a bit but um, you know, those uh, net promoter scores, mm, um, mm, mm, everyone's trying to get a rating, mm. a smiley face, sad face, <laughs> kind of gives us a little bit of understanding in terms of like a brand trust, but that doesn't always speak to brand loyalty. Mm. So mm. I've said a lot and it doesn't always answer the question, but mm. like that's no, just part of the thoughts around yeah. things like this because there is no one mm. answer. Um, okay. And this is the fun thing about actually working in behavioral sciences and being able to work with advertising because I think there's something mm. quite interesting when I learn from people who work in advertising because mm. the way I see things is quite standard, right? So when mm. I say standard, I want to use this search in science. Mm. And you'll find that when we're working with our uh, marketing teams, telling us this is not going to work. Mm. This wording doesn't work on people and like we are arguing against the same thing, you know? And then you find that they're right, and I don't know why. Their <laughs> behavioral sciences didn't work. Well, I suppose advertising is or marketing is a form of behavioral correct, science. Correct. But what I thought was the logic behind a certain mm. decision, it didn't work. And wow. I have no, then I have to go back and figure out, okay, maybe this is what it is. Mm. But it's so interesting to me that there's these two like fields that we all work in and we often will have the same objective, right? Um, and there are certain ways of doing things within advertising that I don't um, properly understand, mm. but they work. And there are certain mm. ways of doing things in what I do um, that uh, people who work in advertising might not understand why mm. I'm doing a certain thing, mm. but they work. Um, and I think it would be like a, quite a great intersection for those two to work closely together as opposed mm. to this thing has been created, change that, change that, change mm, that. Mm. Um, and also, again, very important, maybe bringing back that measurement aspect, um, mm. consistent and like quick measurement. Because um, it's quite important, it's one thing to measure long term, but it's important to be able to measure in the short term as well. Correct. Allows you to figure out, should we mm. chop and change? Mm. It gives you quick results, let's change this. Let's try something else. Mm. Um, as opposed to investing and investing and investing, and ultimately things aren't working. Mm. So I do think there's, um, you know, there's value and it's been proven over and over again. So I'm trying to, you know, it feels like a juxtapose where you say, you know, we are irrational, right? But the way in which we want to get to the solution is an irrational way. We want... Predictable way. It's predictable yeah. way. Like even the argument it needs to make sense. Yes. So if I'm a strategist, I'm putting together a strategy, it needs to make sense to me. Uh, if I'm presenting it to you, it needs to make sense to you. Um, and you know, uh, um, Rory speaks about the idea that, uh, you know, ideas that don't make sense, you know, 
uh, which, which is something that I like. So in the process leading up to change behavior and influence how people do things, certain things, the process leading up to that is a rational one where we have data points to point to. So you see, you see, this yes. is why it'll work. This is why it'll work. Um, and, and I think fundamentally he makes the argument uh, that we should try things that have, m there's no data behind it. Just try it. Just, they don't make sense at all. When we speak about it, it's like, that doesn't make any sense, you know. But we should try those things that, uh, you know, it's like there are a lot of things that we do. It's like, why did you do that? I don't know. It just felt good. Or, you know, it's, 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 it's. Um, I'm not sure what the question is, uh, but I'm just trying to figure out, are we going, I suppose this is the question, are we going about it the right way uh, to solve an irrational thing by being rational? in our process? So I'll give you um, the economist answer. You know how we never really answer questions. <laughs> so <laughs> there is no right way, right? Yeah. Um, oh, like, yeah. <laughs> yes. um, so we try things. Like mm. the point of um, interventions is to try something. And this is why within behavioral economics, we want to do things quickly, measure quickly, because okay. we need to try things. Right? Mm. So yes, um, I do think there's correctness very economist way answer. Um, there's correctness in using uh, rationality, mm. yes, because you need to be able to rationally explain the irrationality. Right? Mm. But it's not to say that your um, idea mm. is going to be completely rational. It mm. could be something that just, um, and when I say that, it's not, it's not that it's not thought out. Okay, it's just true. not something that immediately makes sense to mm. somebody, right? Mm. So, like, yeah, it's yeah, one of those things that just make me laugh. Like, I try to think about the person who first said we need speed humps, when they, when they said that out loud, that we just need to create this yeah. thing that's going to make people slow down. And it was like, no, people need to drive smoother. The drive needs to be nice. Like, we're trying to get traffic moving. And someone's like, no, but we need to put this thing here. Mm. So you can imagine when sitting in that room, some, everyone was probably looking at this person like, that's absolutely crazy. Mm. Why would you Makes need, mm. why do you want to, this is going to damage cars, this is going to, like, this is the implication. But look at how speed humps work now, right? It's Absolutely. something that saves lives mm. altogether, you know? Absolutely. Um, they are an inconvenience, but the inconvenience is, to, and there's nothing you can do about it. You mm. need to slow down. So when I think about things like that, that's actually a rational idea. It just sounded mm. out of this world, for instance, mm. when it was first established. Why would you want to create speed humps? You know, mm. that type of thing where everyone's looking at you like, no, we're trying to make the city more efficient. Mm. You are creating an inefficiency. But maybe the efficient way is actually creating a bigger inefficiency, for instance, mm. lives lost. So things like that, uh, for me, I find those very small ideas that seem mm. like absolutely nothing mm. quite fascinating. Because mm. what was happening that day when that person was like, let's create, let's just put <laughs> this thing here to, you know, then they start to go into the more rational part of it. I mm. am digressing, but yeah. now they have to measure the angles of this yeah. thing. Like it actually becomes something <laughs> that started from absolutely nothing. And now we're mm. bringing in engineers. Mm. Is this the right surface? Like, you know, mm. like all those things. So, yeah, it's interesting. The word engineer just triggers something that Rory also speaks about. Uh, obviously, he's an advocate for behavioral science, right? Uh, and he speaks about how you can manipulate good in, in, in a good way, the mind uh, without having to alter the engineering of physical things. Uh, you know, in fact, he speaks about how uh, pre-COVID, he had the idea of, uh, I think one of their clients was Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, and he had the idea of, um, I think I remember this, mm. no work Fridays or something. Uh, no meeting or no office? No office. No, yes, I remember yes, this, yes, no office Friday, meaning if you're not at the office, then everybody's forced to connect in some shape or form. Uh, then Zoom was the thing, but they never implemented it. And then COVID hit. And then it was I'll like... backtracking. <laughs> it would have been such a great... Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, so for me, it's like... Uh, and, th and that's what... That's what's fascinating for me. Uh, so obviously the product itself has to work. The service has to work. So you can convince people that, you know, from a, from a messaging perspective or from a behavior perspective, you could put markers in place where people are redirected to you. But the thing has to work. Yes. Uh, but I'm fascinated about the idea of being able to shift how people think about, uh, you know, certain things, mm. you know. 
I'm waiting for a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, yeah, that Zoom one actually was quite interesting because it's, 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 quite a, it's quite a great strategy, right? To mm. kind of increase engagement on a certain platform mm. by purely shifting a type of behavior because it's not like people are stopping work, but it's yeah. shifting um, how people behave. The one I find quite interesting, um, and maybe this doesn't really answer your question or speak to this point, because it does involve um, changing some form of engineering, but it does shift decision making. So, mm. um, making sure that, so having like sanitizers by the door in offices, mm. right? and remember, we're not just speaking about uh, a COVID context. This is uh, the different health and safety regulations in different places, right? Mm. So in factories, they found that, uh, or in hospitals, if you have um, these the sanitizers or sanitizers, like machines, what do you call them? What's the right word? Which, which machines? The sanitizer Yes, thing. those okay. sensor thingies. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you have them too far from the doors, People won't use them. Yes, okay. but they're still there. Oh. Right? So you didn't increase the number. Mm. You just changed placement. Okay. And that also will kind of lead people to a certain direction, like in terms mm. of then how you make your decisions. Um, when I say make decisions, how you behave, right? Mm. So um, what was that? Getting people to use stairs more. Mm. Haven't changed anything about the stairs, but they did those piano stairs. Uh, <laughs> is it in the US? Yes. Mm. Those mm. piano key stairs. And suddenly you have people who want to take the stairs, right? Mm. All we want to do here is get people more active. Mm. Stop using the lift. It's also inefficient, you know, mm. like it's running all the time. Yeah. It's expensive, but also we yeah. also want you to be healthier. Yeah. Take the stairs. No, and you find that, or they, d they didn't change anything yeah. in terms of shifting where the staircase is. They d just change how how you would engage with it so it yeah. looks like a piano and people started playing on these things so <laughs> it's quite interesting to me when you can't really pinpoint why mm. you're doing something mm. and nothing's been changed mm. um, so for instance if we're in this room and I draw a hopscotch mm. there's no reason for you to be jumping up and down in that thing but you're probably going to hop yeah. you're going to get there and you're just going to hop because it's there <laughs> but the surface hasn't changed the landscape hasn't changed mm. all I did was color in different blocks True. now you tend to want to play around True. so um, I don't know if I'm answering your question but yeah. I find when we're looking at and when I say engineering maybe you're talking about decision engineering I'm going to talk about physical engineering mm. um, definitely want to segue quickly because I think this is an important one that needs a bit more thought or mm -hmm. maybe more application um, but when you talk about physical engineering making things um, easier in a cheap way right mm -hmm. so driving behavior without having to change a complete infrastructure mm -hmm. right so again when we're looking at you know disabled parking how do we, apart from that demarking of that, so that definitely shifted, right? Having it painted yellow, how often people who don't need to be in that parking mm. are parking there. Mm. But how do we then maybe look at how we make the other parking bays interesting? Mm. Because of course, you're looking at a place where uh, it's a community that's underserviced, for instance, in terms of malls, infrastructure, and the only three parkings that's available for somebody who needs that type of assistance has been taken up by somebody who doesn't need it, mm. right? So then we look at how do we then, in our actual physical engineering, use behavioral science to drive those that don't need to be in this space to mm. go to that one. Mm. Let's make it fun, you know? Mm. Um, it's crazy because we're all like grown adults, but we all like to have fun. So mm. like you could change colors, like there's different things. I haven't really thought about an intervention, but I always think about how do we not use behavioral science in this context? Correct. How do we make sure people aren't going into the disabled bathroom when they don't need to be there, mm. you know? Mm. So like things like that, and that would be something I'd, be, I'd love to work on, you know, because mm. I think more than anything, it would speak to my own, you know, yeah. uh, utility in terms of this is how I'd like to give back, you know, mm. but mm. things like that where the infrastructure is there, but we're not using behavioral science to make sure Correct. it's used yeah. efficiently or correctly. Absolutely. So as I'm thinking, um, for me, it, it's like it's even broader than uh, you know, I think even when we talk about it from a work perspective, we're limiting it. But obviously we should use it, right? Uh, but I'm just thinking generally from a life perspective. And, you know, I'm just thinking about my son now. Uh, when, when he has to do homework and it feels like work and it feels like homework, uh, you forget it. Uh, but once you change the, the engagement and it, it feels a bit more fun, mm. or even a simple thing as me also doing it yes then it becomes like uh okay let's someone do this. else is doing it as yeah. well yeah you know what that reminds me of that old recoffee ad you see these two cookies 
if I had to, you don't remember oh, Ed? Oh, I think I remember. Because it's a kid doing homework. Yeah. And this is how you then bring the family because they all have coffee, but uh, they want the kid oh, to do yeah, homework. Oh, yeah, 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 um, yeah. Uh, I forget the actor's name, but he's Zeb Matabane. I think that yes, is him. Yes, 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 yes. So you see these two cookies and you get the child. Yeah. And so literally, yes. you use then, which yeah. I think was brilliant. Absolutely. So now you have like a, a brand Correct. that's using some form of communal, um, making things easier mm. type of thing mm. as part of the actual, I don't know, the center yeah. of this family unit. So dad can... Uh, drink his coffee, but he can also do homework and he's making it fun and engagement mm. using these cookies that they're all going to eat. Like, I think that was brilliant. Yeah. Sure. So that for me links me to my next question around usually companies get obsessed with the product design, the technology, and all they want to do is to tell consumers about the technology, but not necessarily how that fits into their lives or the relevancy of having this kind of product or service. How do you, maybe also this might be an unfair question, uh, but is there a way, maybe it's impossible, but is there a way, I can also imagine how if I've innovated something, I'd want to tell people like, you see, if you go to the back of this thing, you'll see, you know. And you're but, passionate about and it And I'm passionate well. about it, right? So, which I understand. But how do you get an organization to shift from, and usually the, the psychology of the thinking is, uh, in order for me to sell more of this, I need to tell people about this thing. More and more of And it. more, yes, and how it works and how it... Uh, so I always use the example that none of us actually know the insides of a, of a phone. Like the general person... I knew you were going to go there. Mm -hmm. Doesn't know, you know, like... What, we, all we need to do, or all we need to know is that this thing works. It just needs to work. How it functions, it's, it's, it's you know, it's mm. not... So how, do you, how would you get an organization to shift, to say, okay, here's a campaign. I've got these five benefits. I want you to tell them about these five benefits. How do you convince them to reframe and come from a different uh, departure point to say, this is the best way to sell to it? To do this. Yeah. That's a funny thing because that's the premise of why we measure. Most of the times, the only way we can kind of get people to shift from, uh, especially like a super technical environment, is to show them value. So mm. give me an opportunity to run this thing for three weeks. Um, mm. If I make money for you, great. Um, if I don't, then maybe I don't, don't get paid. So a lot of it is quite risky, right? Mm. Um, but uh, while you were talking, the one interesting thing is um, Samsung, I'm allowed, I'm, allowed, I'm allowed to say brands, right? Yeah, yeah. Samsung, very interesting marketing campaign. Always about the camera. Mm. Sometimes about aesthetics, it's folding now, but always, like I know what the Samsung camera looks like. Every time I think of a phone, <laughs> that's the one thing you see on mm. the internet. It's always about the camera. Mm. And the interesting thing is that I'm, like, something tells me that it works, even though I, as the layman, don't understand what you're saying about like a VGA, like, dude, yeah, are the exactly. pictures nice? <laughs> you know, like I don't, but still anchoring people on that mm. one feature mm. as opposed to all these multiple features mm. which are usually quite consistent across most phones right Correct. and the other phones have cameras too but samsung has like kind of like aggressively pushed this camera mm. camera 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 thing mm. and i'd be interested to see what the numbers look like but i think that is quite a smart strategy because mm. every time i think camera i think samsung whether it's a wow. phone or if i'm thinking of camera i need to go buy a samsung wow. so it probably filters out into other products that they sell mm. um mm. Then they also have these fridges with the cameras. So every time I think Samsung, I'm like, camera, camera, camera. Yeah. Um, and there's something that is uh, quite valuable in making sure that something is available in the human mind. Mm. Right? So maybe the strategy doesn't completely work. And I'm not saying it does or it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't work to um, drive sales. I really think it does um, mm. Mm. for this particular product. Mm. But you're, you're always available in the brain as Samsung when you're thinking camera. Maybe let me use me as an example. Always available. So maybe now it's filtering into other products. And it's <laughs> like, does a washing machine have a camera? Like, what would it be the... Like, camera, camera, <laughs> camera. It's, it's crazy. But every time I think camera, the first thing that comes to my head, Samsung. Wow. I have no reason. And, you know, there are better products uh, or better companies or companies that make better cameras for specific yeah. things. But yeah. because of that phone average. Yeah. Um, and yes, like I said, I digress. Quite yeah. an interesting thing where you have a complex thing 
because the mm. phone ultimately is quite a complex there are a lot of functions on this thing mm. right? and to market every single function is probably not going to be efficient correct um probably going people are going to disengage but mm. to focus on one mm. I mean, I started thinking it's like really, really good. Why isn't yes. Apple talking yes. a lot about their camera? Why are they talking about aesthetic all the time? Mm. I started thinking it's like really good. I have yeah. no reason. I've never actually compared the two. Mm. But now Samsung is putting so much behind camera, camera, camera. Yeah. Maybe there's something to this camera. No, in fact, I think, I think, I think they all do. Um, even in the innovation and the... Mm. So with each evolution or with each new model, I think the biggest thing, the it's biggest the change is the camera. In fact, there's one campaign by, by iPhone which I thought was brilliant. They, they did a billboard and that image was taken with an iPhone. And so they blew it up. Obviously, when you stretch an image, if it it's should off, pixelate. It should pixelate, but that one is like crisp, crisp high quality. Uh, for me, that was like the, 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 the best camera, you know, mm. commercial or, or, or advert. Mm. But I do hear what you're saying because... TV, digital, on YouTube, whatever, it's always the, the camera. They show you how the, cam the, the cameras look. Mm. Uh, so I think that's the game. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a camera. Maybe it's not available. See, that's the problem. Not available in my head quickly <laughs> with Apple. Like, and I know they talk about the camera, um, but like, yeah. No, no. Okay, just, cool. just thinking. So in behavioral science slash behavioral economics, right? Is there a course that one can take or is it a mishmash of different things that come together? Is there, can I go to university to study it or is there a module? How do I get into it? Uh, yeah, so maybe I'll answer that in twofold. Um, I think in terms of where it started, um, a lot of people would come in from different fields, right? Fields of psychology, you know, your um, economists, you have your Dan Ariely's, you have your Richard Taylor's, and these are people who are part of the forefathers who kind of see different things and bring them together um, within the context of behavioral sciences. Um, so a lot of us, when I say us, I'd like to put myself in the same room as those giants. Um, mm -hmm. uh, come from different fields. So for instance, my statistics and economics, uh, no real behavioral economics uh, course, uh, for instance, but they were like within like a microeconomics uh, module, you'll find that there is some two months of behavioral economics. Mm. Uh, but I don't think it's enough for you to understand how it works. Mm. So I didn't really know what it was. I just knew how to pass, you know, um, <laughs> didn't know how to apply it. And mm. I didn't know that this is actually something that you apply. Okay. I just thought it was a by the by. Mm. So when I got into behavioral economy, that was quite interesting to me that this is actually like there's application to this, you know, mm. there's measurements, there's actually there's science to what they were teaching us. Right. But you do find a lot of schools now are actually teaching. So UCT does definitely have uh, behavioral economics um, mm. as a a, like I want to say a module not sure if they have a full course I think they do mm. um, a lot of uh, universities overseas I know in the UK there's a couple where you can actually get a behavioral science behavioral economics qualification mm. uh, masters in behavioral economics and all of that so mm. it is something that is being formalized maybe not quickly enough but mm. uh, I think we are getting there um, but uh, yeah, it would be great to know from inception mm. how to apply this thing or to learn it um, at a a fundamental level as mm. opposed to a lot of us come out and have to learn it from scratch when you start working in practice so you're mm. learning and applying at the same time which is great but i think there's a lot of value in learning the science itself so yes uh you can study it mm. um for instance uh, there are programs within um, companies where they teach um the science itself so it's, it's it's applicable to you know graduates and people coming in who are interested in the, in, mm. in the actual science itself so yes uh to answer your question, yes, you okay. can. Yeah. Okay, to close. So I've got an agency, hypothetically speaking. I've got an agency, it does traditional things. Uh, a brief comes in, hopefully it follows this process. Why are you going to pay me? This sounds like something that <laughs> I bill for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you can put it on my tab. <laughs> By the way, you should consult. Um, uh, this is your first gig. This is your first gig. You know how we are all encouraged to do like pro bono? This is your pro bono gig. And once people see this, then they can come, you know. This is an and ad for you. Buy my services. Correct. How do you think I beat my face? This is an ad for me. Okay. <laughs> hey, girl. So, so I want to set up, right? Mm. Uh, there's the, the existing value chain. 
um, you know, typical brief comes in, it should go to strategy, hopefully it goes to strategy. <laughs> you know, it goes to strategy, strategy does its own thing, and then they engage, strategy engages with creative to say, okay, this is the direction that we found, uh, here's the thing that you need to go with, and the creatives start doing it, uh, you know, they start doing their thing, uh, and then ultimately until we get to, to client. Uh, what I've noticed is that um, maybe if the strategy does not have enough of, uh, you know, loosely insights, uh, you know, that would inform the end product, uh, usually from a creative perspective, depending, but usually creatives would rely on what the strategy presented and almost they never or almost don't include any further insights or thinking to improve upon what maybe strategy may have come with. So in that value chain, if I want to make sure that behavioral science is the golden thread that runs across, mm. how do I set it up? Like what are the tools, what are the things, what are the measures that I can put in place to ensure that whatever solution that leaves that door uh, is imbued with behavioral economics uh, thinking or influence. Mm. And therefore we can assume or hope that that solution uh, has higher uh, you know, propensity to become more successful, to be more effective. So I want to give you the consulting answer. Um, you know how management consultants are really good at repackaging what you say. <laughs> so what you're talking about is an insight-driven strategy, right? Optimizing. Mm. Um, yeah, so insight-driven strategy. So what you do there is you look at different decision points, more than just um, brand. It's not just the advertising. Mm. So one, while you are creating your strategy, you figure out the important decision points. Right? So if for it to be insight-driven, it needs to be customer eccentric, sounding mm -hmm. very, very, yeah, very mm. consultant, but mm. it needs to be customer eccentric. So it's mm -hmm. not just about the, the, the strategy itself. Mm. It's how is it going to be received. Mm -hmm. In order for you to kind of measure or to establish those, you need to figure out where are the decision points because that's how it's received, right? So where are the decision points? What's the communication? When are we communicating? So a lot of the time what we do is to figure out the decision points. I, I know I'm like emphasizing this, but literally, What's important is what is the client going to do? What are they thinking at this point? What's the end user? Once the strategy is in place, um, what's, the, what's happening when the person engages or before they engage, once they engage, after they engage? Um, are there little decisions during the engagement process mm. itself? So it's all about putting in these little decision points and then figuring out, are we driving the right decision consistently? Maybe we'll probably uh, maybe measure at the end, I don't know, but. Uh, sometimes we have to consistently figure out as people are engaging with this, when are they dropping off? How do we bring them back? Mm -hmm. So when we think about creating a strategy, we first would look at what's the um, objective overall. Then we mm -hmm. need to go a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. What's the process? Then we need to go deeper. This process is great. This is what the process is supposed to achieve. But the person using or going through this process, what are they thinking? Right. And if it's a two party kind of process, so um, for instance, if it's I'm going to step away a little bit now from um, like a marketing type mm -hmm. of element. Um, if you're talking to someone uh, who's a, you're purchasing something through a contact center, for instance, that's a two party decision making process that you need to look at. Right. Because mm -hmm. you have your um, consultant who's going through, for instance, your script or your processes, but they need to make decisions along this path. Right. Mm -hmm. And they need to make decisions that actually drive the decisions we're driving at the end user. So it's all kind of analyzing top down. So mm. you figure out and then from there, you can then come up with a strategy mm. that is now insight driven. Mm. And it's not just customer, it's also internal. What are our processes? Mm. Then we can then look at how do we then market for this properly? Mm. Well, that's in my ideal world, world mm. is how I would like, kind of work through that mm. process. Mm. How do we then bring in this? We've got the brief. How do we then execute on this given this analysis that we've just done? Mm. then we create. Amazing. I love it. That's my ideal process. Because uh, we, we, you know, I love the idea of, you know, always thinking about the customer or you can actually bring them in at some point in the process. Uh, but always having them in mind. It's not just about the products, not just about the brand, you know, but who we're doing it for, you know, why are we doing it. 
what I find interesting is that um, people are the people who create these solutions, right? A lot of the time we don't put ourselves in those shoes. Mm. But that time we are creating a solution. But you mm. don't think about, would I follow through on this process? Mm. We think about this is the process that needs to happen. Would I follow through given this campaign? Mm. And half the time, if you just take a step back, <laughs> you'll be like, nah. <laughs> I'm not gonna do this. <laughs> you want me to take a scan, send a, you know, I star mean, one, dun dun dun. Like, yeah. you see, like when you think about, like the solution makes sense, mm. but you never, well, let me not say you. A lot of times we don't mm. take a step back and mm. think about, would I do it? Mm. You know, but yeah. I love it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's been an insightful conversation. Uh, so maybe this might be the first module, the official module of. <laughs> <laughs> the first module of behavioral science and then we formalize it and do a textbook uh you know and we educate everybody then you'd have to bring in real experts um, <laughs> so, <laughs> i mean really now <laughs> okay cool thank you guys for tuning in uh so it has been how does one think like a strategist when it comes to behavioral science luella thank you very much uh i appreciate you coming here um, thank you for having me it's, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. Amazing. Well, to say thank you for your time and effort, mostly for your insights. We've got a small gift for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Was not expecting this. <laughs> oh, definitely a favorite. Oh, oh thank you. Thanks for having me. You are good. Wow. Sing for the Konnichiwa. Yazi bo me la bedi man Konnichiwa